thank you for this. Well, Ron, it is such an honor to welcome you to SCAD to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award in directing. Well, well, well deserved here at the SCAD Savannah Film Festival. I appreciate it. It's, it's, uh, it was fun. Also fun to just sort of uh, drink up the, the environment here around SCAD, the synergy with the community. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. Your time here has included the chance to speak with some students, um, and I was at that master class and at your Q&A. It was wonderful. Thank you for so generously sharing anecdotes and experiences and just answering questions. You know, with such generosity, um, you did such a wonderful job. It's storytelling. At the end of the day, it, technique is a fantastic thing, um, but the more you look for narratives everywhere you turn. Look for them in the news, look for them in your life. And if you keep finding ways to keep analyzing story and then inspiring yourself by what the medium has to offer, I think those are the building blocks to kind of sustain your interest, your creativity, and your passion. You know, smart questions coming from people who are, you know, really committed. Yeah. I find it energizing because you've got to give thoughtful answers. And uh, sometimes you can get onto your own hamster wheel and, um, and you're, you're doing and doing and doing as you've done over the years, but you're not as conscious of why and what the reasons are behind, uh, you know, the decisions that you make or the directions that you follow. So it's, uh, for me, constructive too. What are some things that you found uh, work in the rehearsal process? And like, how have you developed that language and what's your after over the years of your great career? Yeah, great. Um, um, well, I'm gonna do a little name dropping right now. On this one day, I called and spoke to um, Martin Scorsese, Sidney Lumet, uh, and Mike Nichols. Wow. And said, three great dramatists that I really, who I really admired. <coughs> and I asked them, and I said, well, how do you approach rehearsal? And they, they had three different answers, but they really had the same answer. They did, they, everybody approached it in a different way, but basically it was about understanding your actor's relationship to the role they were gonna play. You emphasized that the director is the keeper of the story, and you advised re-watching favorite films or scenes without the sound to hone your skills. Can you recommend a couple of your films we should study? Like, I think it'd be interesting for, for somebody to watch Russell Crowe in a couple of the various uh, stages of uh, his, the development of his character in Beautiful Mind and, and just watch his body. But to look at that, again, without the sound and just understand his body language, the hands and the, you know, the, the eyes of the window and into the soul. You can see what they're feeling and you know, forgetting um, what the words even are in those scenes. That all came from research. You know, you're empathizing with John Nash, you just recognize the kind of pressure that he was, you know, constantly facing. Yeah, and you're teaching a lot about vulnerability Being and about... other. Other, yes. Yeah. In your films, several focus on the hero's journey, yet still convey human frailties. How do you set the size of real story to evoke the empathy that make your films so powerful? I try to deal from a, um, a perspective of relatability, kind of first and foremost. It factors into everything. If you're trying to create suspense, well then the more you relate to what the character's going through or might fear or might have faced in the past, you know, then you'll feel it with more intensity. If it's a comedy, it's funnier if you somehow connect with that character. For example, Henry Winkler is a, just a great comedic actor. I remember when I was directing him, I began to realize why he was so effective, even going back in creating the Fonzie character, which, which I'd you know, experienced acting alongside him. You know, just told you so much about him, sort of the way that time that he improvised this moment where he's Fonzie, he's in the men's room, he goes to comb his hair and hey, he doesn't need to. That was all Henry inventing. It's all about um, those kinds of nuances that give you an insight into what makes that character tick. But I was thinking about, you know, the Frost Nixon film and Apollo 13, people's fear or anxiety or even things that maybe they weren't so proud of. Well, I think that 
again, especially dealing with these, with these stories based on real events, real living, breathing people with all their own frailties and neurosis and concerns and, and somehow either rose to an occasion or desperately tried to and failed to, but, um, but that uh, uh, they're an awful lot like the rest of us. The first movie I ever did based on real events was Apollo 13. I thought it might limit my creativity. However, and I found that it opened up creativity. Now we had our first test screening. So this was our very first screening. They just played it for the audience, Apollo 13. And it tested great. But there was, it was like all excellent, very good. People would recommend it, all of that, except for one. There was one poor. <laughs> out of 398 cards. Didn't really comment, just these bold pencil strokes, just everything negative. Finally on the back, it, 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 it says, uh, please comment on the ending. And it's the only place where he felt like he wanted to contribute. He said, terrible, with an exclamation mark. More Hollywood bullshit, two exclamation marks. They would never survive, three exclamation marks. He didn't know it was a true story. <laughs> Well, I understand you have fondness for VW bugs, or one particular one, and I do too because my first VW bug in 1975 um, really helped to start this college. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I sacrificed mine, uh, <laughs> but I heard you found yours. My first car was a, was a 1970 VW bug. I bought it new. Remember, I had some money from having been on the Andy Griffith Show, and, uh, and it Turned out to be that was the car that I courted my <laughs> now wife, Cheryl, in. And uh, we drove it and then it kind of drifted off into extended family and, and then was eventually kind of sold out of the family. And I thought I would never see that VW Bug again. About 10 years ago, my brother and sister-in-law found it in Reading. They knew it was my car because it had my USC uh, parking stickers. And they acquired it and they shipped it back to us in the east and uh, Cheryl and I still get out there and uh, uh, I quarter her again. <laughs> I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> well, this has been an extraordinary day, one that I will never forget. Thank you so much for being here, Ron. Pleasure. Fun to talk to you.